When a book leaves its author's desk, it changes. Even before anyone has read it, before eyes other than its creators have looked upon a single phrase, it is irretrievably altered. It has become a book that can be read, that no longer belongs to its maker. It has acquired, in a sense, free will. It will make its journey through the world, and there is no longer anything the author can do about it. Even he, as he looks at its sentences, reads them differently now that they can be read by others. They look like different sentences. The book has gone out into the world, and the world has remade it. Salman Rushdie by the time Jean Sibelius began composing his second symphony in early 1901, the success of his tone poem Finlandia had made the 35-year-old a symbol of Finland's struggle to free itself from increasingly oppressive Russian rule. A spirit of ethnocentric authoritarian nationalism had come to dominate Tsar Nicholas II's government, manifesting itself in an increasingly aggressive foreign policy and a movement to Russify all elements of the Tsar's empire. The relative autonomy enjoyed by Finland became a bone of contention among Russian nationalists who looked upon the rising tide of patriotic sentiment among Finns with suspicion and feared that the traditional cultural bonds between Finland, Sweden, and Germany could lead to a German attack on Russia from the Finnish mainland. Thus, the Russian government moved to solidify its authority with a series of controversial measures. In February of 1899, it issued a manifesto decreeing that the Tsar could rule Finland without consulting the duchy's legislative bodies. This proclamation, to which Finns responded with a flurry of protest petitions that included the signatures of Sibelius and more than half a million of his compatriots, was accompanied by censorship of the Finnish press. A year later, Russian was declared the official language of the local government. The final straw was the passage of a conscription law in 1901 that took the independent Finnish army, whose sole mission had been the protection of Finland, and incorporated it into the Russian Imperial Army, a force the Tsar could deploy for battle anywhere he wished. This edict, which essentially compelled Finns to fight and die for their oppressors, quickly transformed Finnish resistance into a mass movement. The sun and atmosphere of the Italian countryside has always been particularly alluring to artists, and Sibelius was no exception. At the suggestion of a benefactor, he traveled to Italy with his family in early 1901, settling in a mountain villa near the northwestern seaside town of Rapallo. It was in this exquisite, sun-soaked environment that his second symphony, which is so frequently identified with Finland's struggle for independence, was begun in earnest. Sibelius' original intention had been to take musical ideas he'd sketched during the previous two years and develop them into one or more tone poems. Now surrounded by a gloriously evocative Italian landscape, he found himself entertaining extra-musical narratives that were decidedly Latinate. The first was a vision of Don Juan's encounter with death that was likely inspired by a performance of Mozart's Don Giovanni Sibelius had recently seen in Berlin. On the margins of a sheet of manuscript paper, he scribbled out the following scenario. Don Juan, sitting in the twilight in my castle, a guest enters. I ask many times who he is. No answer. I make an effort to entertain him. He remains mute. Eventually, he starts singing. At this time, Don Juan notices who he is. Death. Sibelius then noted the date, February 19, 1901, and wrote down a tune that would eventually become the principal theme of the Second Symphony's slow movement. Another sketch yielded that movement's second theme, a melody that was originally given the heading Christus. Over the next few months, the concept of a single tone poem inspired by the Don Juan legend would be superseded by a much grander vision, a suite of four tone poems based on characters from Dante's Divine Comedy. But when Sibelius returned to Finland in June, his perspective changed. Seeing a striking resemblance between the motivic unity of the music he'd composed in Italy and the mode of symphonic composition he admired in Beethoven's orchestral works, Sibelius committed himself to transforming what he'd written into a full-fledged symphony that would be free of all previous extra-musical associations. Working steadily, he tentatively completed the piece in November, only to extensively revise it before deciding in January of 1902 that it was ready for performance.
In purely musical terms, the work that was premiered on March 8, 1902 embodied Sibelius' ideal of the profound logic that creates an interconnection between all the motives, in which a broad mosaic is recreated from what he described as the pieces God has thrown into the world. The three-note, stepwise ascending motive that appears at the symphony's outset is the basis for a symphonic argument that is as tightly and powerfully woven as any, since Beethoven famously used a four-note figure to construct the heroic tapestry that is his fifth symphony. But when the work was first performed, few audience members heard a piece of absolute music. Instead, Sibelius II was prevailingly received as a celebration of Finnish life and the implacable determination of the Finnish people in their struggle to cast off foreign oppression. The most notable articulation of this sentiment came from Sibelius' close friend and colleague Robert Kajanus, the founder of the Helsinki Philharmonic and an authoritative interpreter of his works. The Andante strikes one as the most broken-hearted protest against all the injustice that threatens at the present time to deprive the sun of its light and our flowers of their scent. The Scherzo gives a picture of frenetic preparation. Everyone piles their straw on the haystack, all fibers are strained, and every second seems to last an hour. One senses in the contrasting trio section, with its oboe motive in G-flat major, what is at stake. The finale develops towards a triumphant conclusion intended to rouse in the listener a picture of confident prospects for the future. Although Sibelius consistently asserted that such narratives shouldn't be attached to his symphonies, he was ultimately well aware that he couldn't control the impulses his work inspired. When Finlandia became an international hit, multiple arrangements of the piece began to appear, including a version for military band, a choral orchestral adaptation, and even an arrangement for an orchestra of marimbas. The work's hymn was set to all manner of texts and given titles such as Be Still My Soul, At the Table, and Dear Friend of Mine. Sibelius' complaints about this phenomenon were revealingly fatalistic. It is not intended to be sung, it is written for an orchestra. But if the world wants to sing it, it can't be helped. <laughs>